everybody. Welcome back to the workshop. Um, today I'm going to be doing a little bit of a, like a build along um, series of videos. This will be the first, the first in the in that series. And um, I'm starting with the new version of the uh, medieval crossbow kit. So a couple of the key differences um, with the new version is obviously the tiller this time is in walnut instead of cherry. And the other key difference is we're using a steel prod this time. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is I want to show you how to do some inlays in a really traditional 15th century Central European style. Um, you'll see the, this type of inlay in a lot of the um, contemporary art from that time, as well as um, many surviving crossbows um, have this, uh, this type of inlay that we're going to be doing today. And uh, you'll see on a previous video that I did on the 15th century um, crossbow with the, the two axle lock, it's that kind of inlay. Um, and so today I just wanted to go in more in depth into sort of how to do that. And particularly because um, what we're going to be using, in fact, is these things, sewer couplings that you can just pick up at any um, DIY store, Home Depot, whatever, Rona. Um, so the black one is actually ABS plastic. The white is in PVC. Um, both work really well. PVC tends to wear a little, a little more. It can kind of get a little bit dirty over time. So if you can find white in ABS, that's preferable, but PVC works great too. Um, so I'm going to show you basically how to take these two things, flatten them out, cut them down and make inlays out of them. And then how to install those inlays onto the tiller. So we'll see how far we get today. Um, one of the things that you'll note is we're starting from the tiller blank that comes with the uh, medieval crossbow kit. Um, so we haven't done any shaping to this other than what's already been done, what you get in the box. Um, that's actually what we're gonna start with um, for the first few inlays that we do. And the reason for that is because as you can see, it's still really squared off, right? We haven't taken off these corners or anything like that. Um, you'll see one of my previous videos where I take you through how to really shape this down and take those corners down, put on the stopped chamfers on the front, um, the top, and the bottom. Um, we're not going to do that yet. We're going to do some inlays first, and then we'll get to shaping it a little more, and then we'll do a couple of final inlays on it. Um, it's just a lot easier to lay out the inlays and um, get them carved out. Um, the spaces and the voids in the wood um, to put them in um, when it's still s relatively squared off like this. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to do today. Like I said, we'll see how far we get. And um, yeah, let's jump right in. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take these uh, sewer couplings and we're going to make one cut down the side of each one. I'm going to use the bandsaw for this, but you can use a handsaw. Um, once we've done that, we're going to take a heat gun, we're going to warm them up so they get nice and flexible. We're actually going to basically unroll it and flatten it out as much as we can. Now, one of the things that I find really helpful for doing stuff like this um, is having a flat reference surface. You can actually use um, the surface of your table saw, your band saw, because that's pretty, pretty flat. You can also buy um, a granite um, surface plate, which I have. They vary wildly in price uh, from what I can see. The one that I have costs about 70 bucks on Amazon. And you'll find it very useful for, um, for example, uh, sharpening. Um, you can glue on a piece of uh, sandpaper onto this and sharpen your planes. Um, you can use it for all kinds of sanding. Anytime you need a good, heavy, stout, perfectly flat surface, super handy. So one other really important thing to note, if you're going to use a bandsaw to cut this kind of stuff, you need one that has um, a, f a fairly fine tooth on it. Um, you don't want a rough kind of ripping blade or anything like that. You want something that has a fairly fine tooth because otherwise it's going to grab the plastic right out of your hands and that can result in, um, you know, medical issues. So we've made our cuts. As you can see in each piece. Now one thing you will note um, now that we're moving on to the heating up part is that ABS takes a fair amount more heat than PVC does um, to make it flexible. 
Um, also, this coupling is a bit thicker as well, um, which is actually a good thing for what we're going to use this one for. Um, in fact, you can even get thicker ones. If you get a four inch coupling, the wall is even thicker than that, um, which is gives you some advantages, uh, as you'll see later on when we're actually installing it, um, when we're making that inlay. Uh, but the disadvantage is that it um, not only does the type of plastic ABS take more heat to get flexible, of course, if it's thicker, there's more mass there, it takes just longer to heat that up. Um, but given that it is really cold in this workshop today, um, having this heat gun on for quite a while is not going to not gonna be a problem. Now you're going to notice, I'm going to actually do this in a couple of stages. The first stage that I want to do is heat up the side that's opposite the cut that we made, just so I can start opening the whole thing up, and then we can get it a little bit flatter, and then you'll see I'll start um, heating up the whole surface. When I do that, I'm going to use some blocks of woods to help to sort of contain the heat. I find that actually makes it a f quite a bit more efficient um, in heating up the plastic. How it's doing. Yeah, see that's starting to get nice and flexible. Okay, and that cools off really, really quick. So later on, you'll see when we're actually working with it to get the final shapes of the inlays we want, we have to work fairly quickly because it already, it's really solidified. So next we're gonna do this part and this part, get everything widened out, and then we're gonna lay it right out and flatten it um, with a piece of wood on top. Um, so it'll be between this reference surface and uh, a piece of flat wood. also notice there's this rib on the inside of these couplings. Um, ideally, we want to take that off because um, that's just not something we need. Um, you know, the easiest way to do that is with the bandsaw sort of running it through that way. Um, you can also use a chisel, um, knife, anything like that. Um, but we're not going to deal with that right now. First, we want to get this a bit flatter before we start worrying about that. Here I'm just placing the 2x4, just a regular 2x4 that I'm using to flatten this out. I'm also using it as a barrier to help to sort of contain the heat and reflect some of the heat back a little bit, otherwise it would just blow off in that direction and not really help us. There, we're starting to get nice and flat now. Not perfectly flat, but that will come. Another approach you can take um, when you're doing this, um, which I think we'll actually switch to that now, is if you have a general idea of where you want your inlays to be and how big and so on, you can actually cut this down early on in this process, and then it just makes it that much easier to, to flatten the pieces out. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just flatten it just a little bit more now as a large piece. Then I'm going to put it through the bandsaw to take the rib off. And then we're going to start designing the inlays, measuring. Um, and then we can measure out these pieces and cut them down. And then we're going to be ready to start um, the final shaping of the inlay piece. And then uh, tracing and cutting the inlays. There. That'll do for now. Now, as you'll recall from uh, the previous video that I mentioned regarding the, uh, the double axle 15th century crossbow, I used the uh, medieval crossbow kit for that as well. And you'll notice um, that on that crossbow, the thickest piece of inlay that we need for the white inlay is the part that covers 
here, the front of the tiller. Um, so that really doesn't need to be much more than ooh, an inch and a quarter wide or so. So I think what we're going to do now is just take this over to the bandsaw and just take an inch and a quarter wide strip, continue flattening that out. In fact, we can even cut it down to length a little bit here too, because we don't need it actually that wide, um, or that long rather. And in fact, we don't need it that wide for the whole length either. So uh, again, once we get to um, smaller pieces, you're going to find it's a lot easier to heat these things up and and get them to uh, the shape that you want. It, of course, doesn't help that it is below zero in this workshop right now. Um, in fact, I'm going to go and get myself a cup of coffee, and then we shall continue. Time to put this on the bandsaw. Okay. So I've cut on either side of that rib that's in the middle. And these are a nice size to do the rest of our, uh, to do our inlays. So the next thing you wanna do, you've sort of roughly flattened out your, your inlay material, your PVC. On the top, all these parts I've marked out here, and I don't know if you can really see that on the camera, but what I've done is I've measured out the pattern of the inlays onto the top of the tiller where they're gonna go. Um, these patterns are really just to confirm that, um, rather these lines are really just to confirm that this is the pattern that I want, the proportions look right and everything like that. And essentially what I'm gonna do is, is basically recreate these shapes onto the, uh, onto the PVC. Um, so what we'll do first is we'll measure the major sort of chunks of the inlay and we'll cut the uh, the PVC as we have it now. We'll cut chunks to size and then we'll continue the heating and flattening process, which will be much easier, like I said, because they're gonna be smaller pieces. So I'll just show you now uh, the layout lines that I've created on the top of this tiller. Um, to give you an idea as to sort of um, the pattern that I'm looking for. And this really is a very, very typical 15th century German pattern. And of course, the inlay material that they would use, because it's what they had on hand, was bone. Well, what we have on hand is PVC sewer fittings. So this section here will be one piece. We're moving down. And this section here will be another piece. And we've got a small triangle here, another small triangle, and then a quite a long piece that goes all the way down the length of the tiller. Obviously, that is longer than the PVC we have, so we'll use multiple parts. And hey, you know what? That's okay, because that's, in fact, how they were done historically, because they didn't have typically very long pieces of bone. So when you see um, surviving historical examples, you'll see that the longer pieces of bone inlay will be done in various chunks and various sections because that's, you know, they're limited by the, the size of the material that they had on hand. So let's start measuring our PVC and we'll cut the, the rough cut the, the uh, main chunks to size and then we can start uh, fine-tuning the, uh, the design. So, I've cut some chunks here. This is gonna be the, uh, the larger chunk that's gonna go on the front here. Then I've got a second chunk, which is going to be, at least piece of that is gonna be for this section here. And then I've got this, which I'll be able to cut into the two triangles. Right, and then finally, I've got these two thin pieces, which we'll cut to size and trim down to fill out the rest of the inlay for the uh, the back part of the tiller. So let's get going on that. First, we're going to flatten them. Uh, then we're going to need to square up at least one side because that will be our reference side. So all the measurements will be taken um, from that side, but we'll see how that works shortly. So using the same method as before, we're gonna use a chunk of wood to kind of 
create a, um, a heat baffle um, so to reflect some of the heat back onto the uh, onto the piece so we're a little bit more efficient and you'll see this time that it goes a lot quicker um, to the point where this gets floppy enough to really flatten it out and just to also note when you're doing this it does get quite warm it's probably not warm enough to really burn yourself or anything but it can be pretty uncomfortable when it gets um to its sort of floppy state so just be careful i mean gloves are obviously a good idea um for this um, i feel like my fingers are cold enough that they could really withstand any heat and benefit from it in this cold weather but yes i recommend gloves uh, for this operation so that should be done now look at that, we've got a nice flat piece that we can then work down and shape to the exact measurements that we want. And then you're going to see, um, to get the inlay, uh, the inlay slots exactly right, once we've shaped this, we're going to tape it down onto the tiller and we're going to trace around it with an X-Acto knife, and that'll be the next step. So I'm going to go ahead and flatten out some of these other pieces, and then we'll start shaping them. You'll notice when you buy these sewer fittings on one side, and I don't know if you can really see it, probably not, but on one side there's usually writing embossed, you know, brand names and crap like that. Um, you want to get rid of that. Um, the other thing you'll notice as well is that some of them, some of the sides, actually are quite a bit beveled over. So one side will have writing, the other side is beveled over, or either one of those sides you don't really want because it's not going to fit nicely uh, when you cut in the, the, the inlays. So that's the side that I like to plane down. You'll notice when you're flattening these things out, they, they all get a little bit wobbly and, and things like that. And so that's another reason why you want to plane at least one side nice and flat that you can then use to measure um, everything. So yeah, I like to use a plane. Um, with a good sharp blade on it, very, very shallow depth of cut um, to just rough shape that. And then what I'll do is I'll use that flat granite um, surface. And I'll put a piece of sandpaper on there and just sand it the rest of the way until I know it's a good straight uh, edge. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So what you can do is look at eye on the edge then you can see it's really, really straight. And that's what you're looking for. Now that piece we can start measuring and marking to get our final dimensions. And then we'll cut it. So while I've got the uh, plane out, I'm just going to put a flat edge on most of these pieces. <clears throat> That's another one. Another way you can check for flatness is simply by holding it on a flat surface and shining a light behind and just checking to see if any light is getting through. And if it's not, <clears throat> then you know it's straight. So using the measurements that I put on the, uh, the tiller to just lay out these inlays, That'll be our guide. So we're going to start with this front one. And we know that the whole thing is 12 centimeters long. And the, the widest part, which is most of it, is 26 millimeters. So 2.6 centimeters wide. <clears throat> so we'll start with that. And once we have that piece nice and square, we can measure in... Um, the end where it sort of comes together and it sharpens at the end. And it's okay if these don't don't end up being exactly right because you're actually not worrying about these lines when we're actually going to start cutting uh, the recesses for uh, <clears throat> for these inlays. We're going to use the pieces themselves as the guide for cutting that, and you'll see how that works shortly. Good. So there's one. Now what we want to do is cut that. So normally I would just pop that right on the bandsaw 
um, and do that. But you can do this with a handsaw as well. I find a hacksaw is actually usually the uh, the best saw to use for cutting plastic. Um, <clears throat> if you use a hacksaw, it's got a fairly wide kerf because you'll notice a hacksaw blade is slightly wavy. So that makes a fairly wide kerf. So if you're going to use a hacksaw, um, make sure that you are sawing on the waist side of your line so that you're not actually ending up more narrow uh, than you meant. So we're going to put this on the bandsaw and cut that down. And once we've done that, we can give it a little bit of a plane down to the line. And then we'll, we'll probably sand both those edges as well, just to make sure they're nice and uh, nice and flat. Um, but once we've cut that to thickness, we'll cut in that little, I don't even know what you call that, where it comes in. Um, and then that'll be ready to go on. I'm going to leave it a little long because you'll notice at the end here, this inlay is actually going to go right to the end. So that'll be open. So it doesn't matter if it overhangs because then we can actually flush cut it and it's going to make it actually a lot um, neater at the end. One thing I want to point out <clears throat> is when you get your crossbow kit, um, I've put in a bolt groove, um, which is a very simple and easy way to make sure you've got a good solid place to put your uh, to put your bolts when you're shooting. <clears throat> this particular pattern of inlays and whatnot that we're doing right now actually covers up that bolt groove. Um, that's okay, um, because we're actually going to be putting on a traditional uh, bolt rest at the front in lieu of the in lieu of the groove. I have found that it makes absolutely no difference to my shooting whatsoever, whether it's a bolt groove or um, or the bolt rest. Um, but I just want to point that out, just because this groove is end up is going to end up being gone. <clears throat> if you want to put the inlays in and then put a bolt groove on top, it's simply a question of um, once the inlays are in carving that that groove in the inlays the only problem you're really going to have is at this point here because we're doing two triangles essentially meeting at a point um, so you may want to leave that a little wider okay there we have it you can still see the pencil line there so we're going to pop this in the vise and plane right down to that line yeah, that's just about perfect so there's our first piece. Um, now we're going to uh, cut in the tapers. That's the word I was looking for. We're gonna taper the end. So going back to the tiller where we marked that out. So there's where the taper is gonna be. So we're just gonna measure how long the taper is and how wide it is at the short end. And at this point, because we've planed both sides flat and they're parallel you can really reference from e from either end <clears throat> and get yourself one of these little engineer square it's so handy especially for this kind of intricate work there you can see the lines. We're just going to take that over the bandsaw and whack those off. And there we have it. Now this is where I like to use the uh, surface plate again. We're just going to sand these bits down. It's a little bit more controlled than using the plane for such a small end. Just get yourself a little piece of sandpaper and hold it flat against the surface. Just a gentle, this is what, 80 grit actually, so this is going to be fairly aggressive. But it'll just take off those saw marks, make a nice straight and flat surface. So of course now we've gone over the line that we made, but as long as it's symmetrical, it'll be just fine. That end could use a little squaring up too. The important thing with this is that you get a nice symmetrical piece that's the size you're looking for that looks good to you. And so, now that we've got that, this is gonna sit here on the end.
like so. Now we're going to repeat that process for the next three chunks of inlay. I'm going to go ahead now and measure out and cut the rest of those inlay pieces um, for the top of the tiller. Um, I'm just going to sort of whip through it. It's pretty same-ish at this point. Um, very, very similar to the one that we just did there. So I'm not going to really go into any detail, um, detailed discussion about that. So we're just going to get through those. Once those things are done, we're going to start um, tracing them out um, and cutting in the spaces on the top of the tiller uh, that will accept these inlay pieces. We've got the three pieces of inlay material cut, measured, and ready to go um, for the front part of the tiller. Um, so we're going to focus on that to begin with. <clears throat> now, when you do these, um, I strongly recommend that you do them one at a time. So what I'm going to do first is this one here. So this is the little triangle piece that goes right in front of the, uh, the nut socket. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to start with that. And once that's done, we'll move on to this intermediate piece here, this skinny one, and then we'll finish off with this end one. And again, because we've got that free um, edge at the front, if there's, if there's slight variations in the measurements or anything like that, we know we've got some flexibility, so we'll still be able to get them really nicely um, matched up at all the joints. So the very first thing we're going to do is use some double-sided tape um, this is absolutely essential when you're doing this kind of work, um, at least for me it is, um, because it ensures that you can keep the inlay piece in um, in very secure place while you trace around it with an X-Acto knife um, to get the nice sharp edges of the recess where that piece of material is going to go. Um, so I'm just going to put some of this tape onto the tiller in the place where we want to to do this inlay. It doesn't really matter the size that you're working with right now. Um, obviously this is all going to come off later. Um, one thing to note, when it's cold, tape doesn't like to stick very well. So I actually like to just gently warm up the tape with the, uh, the, heat, the heat gun. So that's nicely stuck down. Now we're going to peel off which can be tricky. There, there's one, the other. Now we're ready to stick down. Um, this particular type of um, double-sided tape that I'm using here is great because it's completely see-through. So you can tape it right across the location where you want and you can still see any guiding marks you have um, underneath. So we're just gonna carefully stick this down. You really wanna do this once, because of course, if any dust gets on this tape, it's not gonna stick very well, and that's gonna be a problem when we're uh, tracing it. So that looks about right. And again, it's okay if it overhangs the socket a little bit, because we're gonna be trimming all that stuff down anyway. So that's really nice and secure there. So now we're gonna get our X-Acto knife, nice fresh blade on it, and using a very gentle um, stroke, at least initially, we're just going to trace along the edges of that inlay piece. So you can see I'm using multiple passes, because you don't want to press too hard, because that can kind of throw you off especially if you're going with the grain sometimes the knife wants to follow the grain so it's good to at least for the first few to use fairly gentle pressure until you've got a nice cut going and then you can apply more pressure because the gut the cut um, will start guiding the blade so there's one side done and we're going to do this side nice and gentle to start
there. I think that's pretty good. The cut that you make here doesn't have to go all the way down to the depth that we're looking for. It just needs to be enough that it's visible um, and that it's going to create a good um, border between the material that we want to remove and the material that we want to stay. Um, so now that I've done that, we can actually just pry off this little bit of inlay material, pop it off. And at this point, you want to make sure and mark and I've done this before where I don't mark the orientation or the top and bottom. And then sometimes you have to fiddle around with it to get it to fit once you've cut the recess. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to flip it over. B for bottom. And I'm going to put an arrow pointing towards the front of the crossbow. So we know it orients like that. So now that that's done, we can actually just take off this double-sided tape. Find it good once you get one chunk off you just start sticking it onto the other ones and just actually get it all off so once you've you've got the tape off um you can kind of see where the lines are and just score them just a little bit deeper if you want to just to make sure you've got a good clean line and that's done so now um, you're ready to actually take out that material. Um, the way that I used to do this um, is with a chisel, and then I made a homemade router plane, which essentially is a block of wood with a chisel in it um, that you can fix the chisel at a certain depth to really get a nice flat bottom on that. Now I'm fortunate enough, I have a small trim router that I use to take this material out, but you can absolutely use a chisel um, it's fairly forgiving, um, and the reason for that, and this is really, really important, when you're chiseling out and taking out this material, you want to be really aware of the depth of the cut, right? Obviously, you don't want to go deeper than the, uh, the inlay material itself, and in fact, you want to go slightly shallower, and the reason for that is once we have this in place and we're going to glue it in using epoxy, um, we're going to be planing and sanding this down so that it's completely flush with the top. Um, so obviously if you make the recess the exact same width of um, depth rather as the, the depth of the inlay material, um, you're not really going to have much uh, material to remove and you'll have to start taking more off the top of, of the, um, the tiller, which you don't really want to do. Um, if you end up taking a little too much material out, that's totally okay. You can actually fill it in with some sawdust, um, even some wood shavings with some epoxy and just build it back up again a little bit until it's at the level that you want. Um, that's one of the nice things about using epoxy is that when it, when it cures and solidifies, it's essentially like a, a hard plastic. So you can, build, you can build the surface back up a little bit with that. But right now we're gonna dig out the router And this is a, uh, just a small trim router. Um, and we can adjust the depth by literally putting the material or maybe something a bit bigger, a piece of the material. And you can look at the edge and see exactly what the depth of the cutter is. And so you can adjust the depth of the cutter until it's where you want it to be. So like I said, in this case, we want it, the depth of cut to be slightly less than the thickness of the material. It's pretty good right there. And so we're ready to go. Now, as you'll see, we've, uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, um, we're doing these inlays now before we've done any carving. And that is part of the reason is because we're using this router. We want a nice, flat, fairly broad surface. Um, for the, the guide of the router to sit on so that we know exactly where we are in terms of the depth of cut. Um, so I like to start this actually in the recess itself um, so you get a nice clean um, progression into the first part of the cut. Now obviously when you're using a router for something like this you want to be really really careful because if you lose control of it Obviously you can injure yourself, 
But aside from that, um, if you go off beyond the edge of where you want um, the cut to be, that's kind of hard to come back from. I mean, you can certainly fill that in um, with wood, um, sawdust or whatever, but it's never gonna look quite like how you want it to look. So be really, really careful. Get as close to that line as you're comfortable with, um, but you don't have to get right up to it because then we simply take a little chisel and we can use this to take the rest of that material out. And because we made those initial cuts with the X-Acto knife, it's actually fairly easy to do. When you're getting into these small little spaces, like really small little points like that, like at the point of this uh, triangle, it helps to use a little knife. This is a little Japanese knife. Um, I love this thing. It's really cheap. It's called a Kiridashi, and it's got a really nice um, one-sided bevel, so that's called a chisel grind. So it's super easy to sharpen. It's carbon steel, so you can get a really sharp edge on it, and it's got this little point that you can get in there to fish out the rest of that waste material. And when we get around to the point where we're starting to really finish off the surfaces, a knife like this is great. You can make it really sharp and use it for scraping. And you'll see later on that, um, when, especially when we're finishing the surfaces where the plastic is, the, surface, the plastic responds really well to a scraping motion. Um, yeah. So now we're ready to fit this in and see how the fit is. So one thing you'll notice right away is that the bottom of this triangle is actually slightly wider than the socket. So that means we need to just shave down these edges just a little bit. And we're gonna do that using sandpaper on this uh, flat surface here. So what I'm gonna do here is just sand down these two edges. This is the back edge that goes uh, against the socket here. So I'm going to shave down both these edges to just narrow this out. There we go. It's in there pretty nicely. A little bit more off that corner. So as you can tell, doing this stuff, it can get a little fiddly. You know, getting these things to fit right making sure that the gaps around the material, the inlay material, are as small as possible. Um, but because we're using epoxy to glue it in place, again, pretty forgiving stuff. So when we put this in, if you've got some gaps, you can always fill that in with some glue and sawdust and things like that to just fill out some of those gaps. So that's ready to glue in now. Okay, so we're gonna do that now with some epoxy. So the stuff that I'm using is uh, two part, five minute epoxy. Um, I like this one, I'm not being endorsed or anything like that, it's just this one particularly works for me, but I think any old two part epoxy will do. So you just want to take some epoxy, put it on the, remember, put it on the bottom we've marked. Just a generous amount. And simply press it in place. And that is that. Now the reason why we're using epoxy is because I've actually tried with wood glue as well. It just, just doesn't work as well. So there we have that. We're going to let that dry and then we'll just continue on with the rest of these. Again, it's just more of the same as what we just did. Taping down the uh, piece of inlay, tracing around it with the X-Acto knife, and then using our router or if you want a chisel and just getting rid of all that waste material very carefully and um, gluing these pieces in.
So another trick that I like to do, especially when the epoxy is quite uh, cool in temperature, it's very sort of thick, um, is just hit it with the heat gun a little bit. And that makes it runny and it makes it a lot easier to spread out. So I've just got the heat gun on low here and I'm just, this spreader is kind of crampy though. There, that's done. Once that's dry, of course, we'll cut off that excess, excess on the end there. But it's pretty good. The, the gaps around it are very, very slight. Um, they probably won't even need filling in because they're so small, they won't really be noticeable. And the join between the two pieces here is also nice and tight. And there's, I got the epoxy right up against the edge of this piece here, so it's gonna help to fill in that gap too. So let's put on the spring clamps and let that dry. And then it's on to the back end. So when you're fitting uh, these inlay pieces into the recess, once you've, you've made it, <clears throat> um, sometimes, especially in these long, thin ones, and you may have noticed when I was tracing with the, um, with the X-Acto knife, it moved ever so slightly over a little bit because the blade pushed it a little. And of course, what that means is that the, um, the recess is now slightly narrower than the um, piece of inlay itself. So the easiest thing to do here is not to widen the recess, but instead to slightly narrow um, the piece of inlay. And uh, the way you can do that is by scraping it with a sharp knife like that. It just takes off a very thin layer, a very thin layer of the, uh, of the material. You can do that on both sides. See how that fits now. So it's fitting well at the front here. Oops. Yeah, I think that just about did it. And just slightly more. Again, just with the edge of your blade, nice sharp blade at the edge. Just put it more or less 90 degrees on the thing, maybe a little less in the direction that you're going. Just gently without too much pressure you can see it just takes off a tiny little bit of shavings right there nice and thin and that's really the trick with all of this inlay work just take your time take small bites a little bit at a time There it is. You can even 
tapping in a little bit more. That's a nice tight fit. That's going to be great. Now, one of the things I forgot to do on the other ones, which isn't critical, but it can help um, the inlay material to adhere, is if you just score it lightly with a with a knife, um, just to give it some texture and something for the, t the epoxy to grab onto. It doesn't have to be hugely extensive. Um, and again, not required, but especially if you're using bigger pieces. On this one, it's not really necessary. Um, but if you're using bigger pieces, um, it's always a good idea. <clears throat> and again, if it's a really tight fit like this one, a few taps with a mallet. There. It's another piece done. I'm going to wait for that to dry before I dig out the rest of this um, slot and fit in the next piece. Now, obviously, uh, the skinny one on the end, it's actually going to be too skinny for the, uh, the width of the cutter that I have on my, um, on my router. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and do this uh, with chisels. Okay, so we're all glued up now <clears throat> with all these pieces of inlay that we've put in the top. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're simply going to shave down uh, the inlay material um, that's still protruding above, above the top and just get it nice and flush with the surface. Um, so to do this, um, the tool that I like to use most is a spoke shave um, with, a flat, with a flat sole on it. You can kind of see block plane that we we were using before is going to work pretty well too. Um, both of these cutting methods uh, are good for the first part of reducing um, reducing the extra material here but at a certain point we're going to want to s switch over uh, to scraping. So the key thing here is just taking small bites um, with whatever tool you happen to be using. Just make sure that you're uh, not trying to take too much off at one go because you'd be in danger then of actually cracking uh, the plastic, which we don't want to do. So when I'm doing this, what I'm doing is I'm starting with the edge. Um, so instead of going flat right on the top, I'm kind of holding it at a slight bit of an angle. In fact, moving the, the plane over a little bit too to get a more of a glancing cut. And then just gradually starting to take material off. Um, you can see this protruding part here. We can actually take that off now. I think that's going to make our job a little bit easier. Sometimes that happens. That is a pain. Well, in the interest of transparency, this has come unstuck. You'll notice there's no epoxy on this at all. That's because I didn't score it. So that's a lesson right there is make sure and put some little knife score marks in there because that'll get the epoxy to adhere to the plastic a bit better. That's a pain. 
So I'm just going to scrape out some of the epoxy that's in there right now with a chisel. So to score that, again, I'm just taking the point of a knife and just doing like a crosshatch kind of pattern on it. And all that's doing is creating a bit of texture on the bottom. That's going to be a little bit more surface area, a little bit more texture for the, uh, for the epoxy to grab onto. So now I'm using my sharp Kiridashi knife to just scrape. Scraping works really well with these plastics. This is going to take off a lot of those chatter marks from the uh, spoke shave and from the plane. And of course, this is all going to get sanded down a little bit more when we're finishing the whole thing off. So that's terrific. Just, let's just take a closer look at what we've done here. So it's nice and flush at the top of the tiller. Pretty much all the way down. It's a little bit proud there still, but feels pretty good. The best way to t test it is just with your finger. There's a couple of proud places, but we'll finish those off with the with sanding when it comes time to finish it. And there it is. Right. Well, thank you very much for watching. Um, we're finishing up for today, um, having done the top, um, the top of the tiller, all the inlays in there. Um, from here, in the next video, we're going to do the two inlays on the sides. And those are going to start at this axle hole and repeat that triangular shape here and go down perhaps not the whole length of the tiller. We'll decide what's going to look good. So there's going to be one of those on each side. Then on the bottom, we're going to do a little inlay around the opening for the trigger lever. And we're going to do another little inlay at the bottom of the front part. So there we have it. We'll see you on the next video. Um, until then, uh, keep in mind these uh, medieval crossbow kits are still on sale um, for a little bit longer. I'm going to need to close off sales uh, towards the end of uh, this month, towards the end of February. Um, but they are still available, so definitely order yours now while they're still available. And uh, we'll see you in the next video.